I started this layout in uh, 2002 after we uh, moved here. This is what the layout looks like now. Uh, the lumber mill site. It's built in a bay in a uh, garden window. It's about uh, four and a half feet deep, um, and uh, seven to feet wide. So it was a little awkward location to duck into and duck out of. So I had the choice of building around the perimeter of it, and I said, "No, this is a good spot for a mill or some big industry, with the main line here running across the front." So this is the main line and then uh, the main mill storage buildings and the log dump. So we'll go through this. <clears throat> the, the lumber company mill is the major feature of my layout. It's totally scratch built and it was inspired by uh, photographs in a book. Uh, I have several books by uh, Hank Johnston on logging in uh, California. So I drew the uh, plans uh, uh, for the structure and made drawings for the uh, layout machinery and lumber handling. So we'll talk tonight about the overall mill site and the mill itself, uh, but we may cut this off depending on how much time we got. And then a subsequent clinic I'm prepared to do is all of these other topics, which are parts of the overall scene. Here's my layout plan. Uh, this is the stairway coming up from the uh, uh, family room and from the garage where most people will come when they come to visit the layout up the stairs. This is the first thing you see at the top of the stairs. This is an access door out to the hallway up for the upstairs bedrooms, the suite of bedrooms. And then here is the mill site itself, this bay window that uh, has a window here that's never been open <laughs> with the shade and so on. I'm sure the uh, Neighbors think I must be growing marijuana or something out like that upstairs because it's shades always closed. So this is the area that I where I had to fill with the mill. This is the inspiration for my mill uh, by the Sanger Mine, a mill company in a, a Converse Basin in California. Uh, it's in Northern California and, and the Redwood country. Um, I was just immediately attracted to this photograph because of the roof structure and all of the angles and the, the tightness of the, the compactness of this site. Um, this is the boiler house, of course, and then the end of the building where the lumbers, finished lumbers brought out and loaded onto cars. The one thing I immediately noticed about this is that this is on piling, which is interesting, but it's not over water. It's a dry landing. And the logs on the backside, and I've got a lot of photographs of them I'm not sharing tonight, uh, were all moved around by uh, uh, block and tackle and uh, so on. So the, the, the lumber was stacked onto these cars and brought out through the trackage to this trestleway here, which was an incline. Uh, and this, the cars were moved up to the top of the grade by cable. And then the, the other side, they were lowered down to a landing uh, over here, and then uh, Shea took them to uh, to the outside world. So I just thought this was a very fascinating structure. The only thing I didn't have was enough information to give me dimensions. So you had to dedu deduce this. Turns out it had tar paper roof on all of it, basically. Uh, and these tar paper rolls, I figured were 36 to so inches wide. And it turns out when you've over overlapped them uh, with two inches on each uh, roll, each side, you end up with a, a uh, calculation that this thing was built in two foot increments. And so uh, by calculation, I came up with 48 feet across from here to here. And the building's about 130 feet long. It's built in S scale, S for SN3. Now here's a shot of the basic area that we're talking about. And this is the rough uh, road bed that I had laid in just to do some planning and layout work. Uh, this is a set of the drawings that I made and uh, wrapped them around a paper box to get an idea of the scale and, and, and the impact of the building in the, in the overall scene. And then I started to rough in some of the scenery with uh, the blue foam and there's a plywood piece cut out with the radius for my log dump. 
And this is just sort of how I roughed out the scene. Started to think about the backdrop. And so this is the along the wall of the, and the windows behind here. And this is my uh, infamous bendable plywood. Home Deep, uh, the uh, guys on this old house used it in one of their shows and they called it wacky wood. But <laughs> I had never heard that term. But anyway, it's an imported material. Uh, it's an eighth of an inch thick, comes in four by eight sheets, and it's bendable on either one of the two axes. It'll bend this way, or you can you can get it so that it bends the other way. Um, in this case, it makes really nice tight radiuses. It's uh, a genuine plywood, about uh, five thicknesses or she uh, layers, uh, with no voids in it, and so it's incredibly smooth and uh, in transition. And the nice thing about it is you anchor it with either glue or in this case, sheetrock screws onto the, uh, on some boards behind here that are uh, tied to the uh, bench work. And then uh, you fill in the, uh, you the glue holes and then you back the screw out and then you fill the hole with the wood putty, sand it down, prime it and paint it. And it ends up just dead smooth. And it's very, very stable. And it's incredibly bendable. This is a piece of it that I bent here uh, at the transition. This is at the, the left side of the, uh, the mill site. And here you can see my diagonal uh, ceiling, which is a, a limits me on what I could build there. This break in the, uh, the, the, the knee wall is at 48 inches off the floor. So here's an overall view of the buildings. Uh, and this is that uh, piece that we that we just showed being bent. And here it is mounted on the, uh, the structure. And then it's uh, actually screwed to the wall. The screw holes are, are filled and sanded and it's ready for, uh, for what I'm gonna put up here by way of backdrop. And this is part of my layout itself. As you can see, um, it's got a substructure here and there's a, a left side and a right side. And in the middle, there's a place for a tray where a, um, a, a movable piece of the layout fits. And here's the extension beyond the, the, uh, uh, the window area. And then this is the structure where the mill will be. This is my friend, Bruce Hanley, who's helped me with the layout for years and years, years and years and years. And years. And uh, he's working on sanding uh, one of those uh, places where we fitted it to the wall. Where did you get that plywood? I got it at Compton Lumber in South Seattle. Uh, they handle all kinds of interesting products. They're very, very knowledgeable and competent, or competent. Uh, but uh, they're down off of First Avenue South. Compton Lumber Company. There are other specialty uh, lumber yards, but you'd have to call ahead. I'm not sure whether a couple of the others, uh, local ones like Dunn and others handle it. It's not cheap, but well, any plywood right now is not cheap. But the thing is it, it's easily uh, cut. Like I say, it's an inch, an eighth of an inch thick and it uh, cuts very, very smooth with very little chip out and that sort of thing. Or you can put it on a hard surface and cut it with a taping knife. And you can also use it actually substructure for buildings and that sort of thing. Here's some of the backdrop that I've painted uh, with the uh, the blue sky blue. And that was going to be used elsewhere. So here's the backdrop in place. This was a, a backdrop warehouse uh, print that I got from Steve DiPolo when he had a shop in uh, Redmond there and uh, served for a couple of years. And this sort of gave me a sense of what the overall scene was gonna look like. And here you can see the substructure with the pink foam. And I built it up in layers because I was gonna carve it. Here's a, a close up view of the structure itself in place where it was going to be in its orientation. Just another shot of the the area around the mill. The log dump track comes here, and you can see the general elevation of my track 
track work here. This is not uh, a rocket science at all. It's pretty rough actually. And uh, uh, this is definitely not built in modules because this would all not travel. So here's the inspiration for my log dump. This was a uh, photograph in the book, uh, uh, Logging in Skagit County. And this is the English Bay Lumber Company. And he had this big log dump up high. And I thought this was really, really slick. And here you can see the uh, the, the uh, structure that has cable that wraps underneath these logs and dumps them off onto the into the pond. And this is the area I was really kind of interested in. This is called a brow log. And the interesting thing to me about this is that they chose to build this on a rock outcropping. And uh, so I thought, well, fine, I've got the ability to model it. So here's the rock outcropping. I built it and scenic it before putting any track down. But the, uh, and you'll see where the track work will go here shortly. So here's the uh, project underway. And you can see I've got this all built in, sort of the fundamental roadbed here. Uh, this is the opening for the uh, the sliding tray, and there's the uh, cleat here that on each side that lets this tray, which is roughly four feet on each side, slide out, and I can slide it out and set it on sawhorses in the middle of the room so that I can work on it. Because this, like I say, is about five feet deep here. And it, you don't want to be bending over working on a, on a detailed model. Another shot of it looking in. And you see the layers of, of uh, pink foam and other stuff that I used to build it up, trying to come up with a satisfactory height for the mill pond. So here is the mill pond being built. And you see I've, I've uh, poured plaster here and smoothed it out uh, to get as, as level a surface as possible. And you can see here the joint where the, the, the sliding tray will move out. And there's another shot of it and the texture of the, the surface of, of the pond. And then here you can see this slides underneath this rock outcropping uh, with this, the uh, pink foam used as a substructure. So here's that shot of the uh, the brow log is going to go, and here comes the log dump track and the brow log. And I fitted it in here so that I was quite comfortable with its the radius and how it would work. Um, I didn't want to extend it on beyond this because it's just really hard to reach in there. Uh, but this is early on in the construction. I originally had designed it for three tracks here to come along through here to provide some switching. But I ended up, this was going to be too thick as a section here. And I didn't think it was prototypical at all because this is built on trestles. But I left this turnout in place and you'll see what ended up uh, being used for that. So here's another overall view. And here is uh, a laying in of the, uh, the log dump track itself. I built it on the bench on a single sheet of uh, of a single structure. And that's so I could adjust it where it was going to move and so on. Did some more scenic work. And there's sort of the overall scene with me standing in that opening. And you can see why I did this because see the lights up here. It's the only way you can get in there to change those lights. And I did because these were original halogen lights. And as you all probably know by now, if you haven't, if you've used them, they are hot as all get out. So this ended up being something of an oven in here, particularly in the summer. So I've changed everything out is all LEDs now and a whole lot cooler, but this is the overall site. Now this is later in the process because you see the backdrop has changed. Now tell me what's wrong with this backdrop for a mill site? Who knows? They never cut the logs. Yeah, you'd never find a mill site anywhere in the world that close to a mill with that stand of trees. Anyway, this is a backdrop was painted by Ian Henderson, who painted all of my backdrops. Uh, and he did the backdrops for uh, Michael Connell's layout, and that's how I met him. 
really fine artist. And uh, this was the first one to go into place. And you see here they join and I put a backer behind this uh, so that this one and the one adjoining it would glue to it and uh, pretty much tried to hide the seam. Not perfect, but it is adequate for my purposes. Put this in here to show you how I made the uh, the piling. Uh, these are cedar. Uh, I had several spare cedar shingles from my home. And I made a template out of aluminum, uh, an eighth inch thick piece of aluminum. I drilled a hole about a quarter of an inch. Well, actually a series of holes to uh, push these through in a drill press. These blanks, they were square originally and push them through increasingly small or diminishing diameter holes until I came up with this finished product. So I just made, you know, maybe five or 600 of these and uh, pick the ones I like. It, it left a very nice texture on the surface of the piling instead of using wooden dowels. I always thought the wooden dowels were just too regular. So you build the trestle upside down and uh, here's your cross beam and uh, just glued these in, pay in place. All of this was done with the Eileen stacky glue. And here's another couple of shots, built tons of these. And here they are going together in place on the log dump track. And you can see I had the, the base already set up here, the smooth surface. So wherever these piling landed, uh, I just drilled a, a three eighths inch hole and these all set in place. And then I filled the holes back with plaster to uh, pretty much make it smooth and then painted it and so on. Here's that uh, rock outcropping underneath where the brow log is going to go. And here's a little more detail as it's getting finished. Were those uh, logs, those pilings that they drove in or they just sit on the rock or in the water? Well, no, they, they were driven and well, they probably would hit the, the rock here not too far, uh, but they would drive them as far as they could into the mud and that sort of thing. Was, did you give any thought to diagonal bracing? Um, no, I do have some diagonal bracing in here. Yeah, good okay. question. I think you'll see it in some other shots, uh, particularly here with the brow log. Keep in mind, these were moving at slow speed and each individual log car is not that heavy. Here's the brow log. And this is just a, a, a big fir log in this case, because cedar would have shattered. And I uh, weathered it and because this is where the cable would be. And this sort of was then weathered down as it worn away by the cable. Now, this platform is for the operating machinery for that uh, pole to lift the logs. And here's a little more detail with uh, some sheet iron on the uh, brow log here to keep it from wearing so so rapidly. And here is a small donkey engine that was used to operate the cable for the, uh, the A-frame here. And then beyond it is a little uh, area where fuel uh, cut wood was used to store uh, for storage to uh, feed the boiler. Then I put some logs along the front here so that the main logs from the in the pond wouldn't get jammed in underneath the trestle. So then this is the mock-up of the pond. And uh, a lot of my track work is sort of built as you go, not necessarily following a specific plan. So I'd throw a turnout down. Um, many of them were uh, fabricated at the workbench, um, all basically number sixes and some Ys. Uh, but this was to figure out an alignment and spacing and that sort of thing. So this changed over time. But here is a mock-up of the location of the mill. This was done with Photoshop on a photograph taken of the site. And this is another view of the same area. And this is the area where originally I had three tracks. And you see this is a solid piece of plywood here. Uh, but this track turned out was left in place in this little stub siding was used for a, another industry spot. So here's a mock-up of the mill uh, using, uh, what do you foam call core. this board? Anyway, foam uh, core. Yeah, foam, foam core. core. <laughs> anyway, to, to uh, sort of mock up the building in its location based on my scale drawings. 
And uh, although this kept getting bigger, um, this is scale 134, 138 feet long. And um, this is a relatively small mill, actually. They take a lot of real estate. Real estate. And here you can see the, uh, the trestle work that I built in here. Now the tray is right here. And in front of the tray is this piece that has the track on it. And it lifts straight up to permit this to be slid out. And this is held in place at each end with a, a, a design of the, the wood, sort of like a V, v shape, so that this is trapped in an absolutely firm alignment. And uh, it's pretty easy to do. And you get fine adjustments using screws, sheetrock screws, to hold it vertically and, and uh, horizontally. This is getting closer to a finished scene. Uh, you can see here this. Uh, piling is just sitting on top of the surface. Uh, and I'll show you some other views of this, but it's starting to look like a more complete scene. The dam uh, was built out of a, uh, a tunnel casting from Chooch Hobbies, an SKO tunnel portal. And I cut it on in uh, pieces with a bandsaw. And uh, the way those pilasters on the, uh, the, the tunnel portal worked out they just were perfect for cast pilasters on this uh, on this dam and this is the lake level here and then this is the little boards that will be lifted out to open up the spillway because periodically they would flush the pond out and keep in mind that almost all of these ponds were relatively shallow uh, less than 10 feet deep uh, because they would uh, flush them periodically because of all the silt and crap that would build up in here uh, so and then the sinker logs would 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 uh, get waterlogged, and they'd have to lift them out with a crane and cable uh, periodically, and then send them through the mill. So, so this is a, a a berm designed to uh, create the pond. What did the silt going downstream do to the fish eggs? Uh, we didn't worry about any old fish eggs back then. Actually, it, it, it yeah, <laughs> this was not a huge amount of water, actually. But no, that's a good, well, they wouldn't worry about that back in the 30s. So here's more detail of the pond as I, and the spillway as I was building it. And here you can see this was all just rock material poured in place out of paper cups to build it up to the height I wanted. And then the stream was built in here. Going back to the mill itself, I built the uh, substructure for the film uh, for the mill at the bench. And all of these uh, piling were the same length. And I moved it around to get it in alignment of where I really wanted it to be, made sure that it was level. And then here where it came up to the shore in the shallow area, I actually uh, just located where the piling were going to be and I got out my, my little drill and drilled holes and then dropped the pilings down in those holes and then backfilled it with the plaster and then painted it. And here's some of the substructure for the for the mill itself. I'm going to do a subsequent program if, the, if you guys are interested on the building of the structure of the mill itself. But the fundamental thing about it is that this is one structure. There is a floor system for the mill itself that fits on top of this. And the boards are designed to interact to keep it in a stable location. So you've got this structure, you've got the floor, then you've got the first level of the mill, and then you'll see a roof structure. And then on top of that is a clerestory structure. So there's really five basic pieces to this mill. And here again, you can see the substructure the first floor, the main floor, which will have all of the machine relocations on it, the first level itself, this um, structure is part of this one, but then this top section lifts off. And then I built a dock along the front of it, uh, similar to what was on the prototype. Uh, and so small lumber, uh, is comes out here and is stacked into either box cars or on flat cars, and the bigger stuff comes out this end. Another picture of the overall site. We 
which shows this <clears throat> um, this dock with track on it. A walkway along the side of it. I um, haven't built a railing on there, so occasionally a logger would uh, end up in the drink. And uh, but I did put a ladder down here at the end so they could get uh, get out of the water uh, if you'd fallen in. And I'd experimented with uh, a little catwalk here. Uh, you'll see on the layout that stub from that turnout that was not used actually ends up being a little uh, short location, stub short location uh, for bunker fuel, which is used to, to fire the boiler um, at the mill. We don't burn the wood product, the byproducts of the scraps and all that uh, because we actually uh, recycled it and it's shipped out in gondolas to uh, to other uh, users of that of the sawdust and, and mill cuttings. Do burn some stuff in the boiler house. So that's why you don't have a sawdust. Burner. That's why I don't have a sawdust burner. And the other thing is, you you look at this site. There's really not that much room, and because the uh, the the sawdust burner wouldn't be that close to the building. They're usually you know three or four hundred feet away. With big, so you, you might know. have to go down a scale and give you some forced perspective. The burner's back in oh, a distance. No, that's an absolutely good suggestion. And there is room actually to do it over here where I have the dry stacks and that sort of thing. So the, again, one of the early attractions to me uh, about this, this mill was this angular convergence of all the roofs and sidings. And I thought this would be really clever to build. And here you can see the way this siding is it overlaps the stuff below, and that's this piece just lifts off. <clears throat> Here's a couple of shots of the mill itself under construction, but I've got a lot more detail on this. Um, one of the things I researched early on was the structure of these trusses. Um, there were several different ways you could build trusses. These are modeled after the ones in California, which had the, the cross bracing in a certain pattern but there were several variations of this. And then at the end of the day, I realized that I needed something beyond the end of this building for the jack slip. And so the, the jack slip comes here and this will be where the, the log uh, carriage is uh, loaded and, and run past the head rig down here inside. Another couple of shots of the same structure. This piece is removable. So this is a separate structure from this, and it just sits on top of the uh, the pond. And here I designed sort of where the green chain was going to be for sorting the, the material. This is in alignment with the head rig, and there's a track right here. And it's designed so that when they cut large beams, which in many cases were 20 inches on a side by 20, 24 feet long, those would be loaded straight out from the head rig onto the loading dock and loaded onto flat cars and shipped out. The mill was designed to handle lumber that was designed to uh, functionally used in the mines. So these would typically be uh, four by fours at the smallest and um, a lot of six by six and eight by eight material. So some other shots of the location. Uh, there's a little uh, building here that covers the steam engine and boiler that handles the uh, cable work for this uh, A-frame. Here's some early cars I had here. I had a string of these. I sold them to some guy. I, I really want them back, but they're gone. And then the logs. Uh, and you'll notice that there's no water surface here. I've had several questions about that, but I chose to that the to do this way uh these are all just sitting there uh, because the pond is incredibly muddy and over time there'd be an awful lot of stuff floating around in and amongst the logs so i figured it'd be just as easy to leave this the way it is again you see the details with the logs laying in here to keep the stuff from migrating underneath here and then here's the ramp that carries the logs into the into the mill. This is basically two logs, one on each side of a piece of sheet iron. 
or sheets of iron that overlap each other. And it's about a four foot wide area here. So they would capture the log uh, with a cable and drag it up into the mill. And that's modeled after an actual location of Port Alberni up in, on Vancouver Island. Here's the backside of the mill, which you typically can't see from the uh, from the layout, but I thought I'd, I'd not cheat. And I went and, and finished the backside of it. And here you can see the uh, the logs up on the land or the uh, piling up on the land. And here's sort of the finished site uh, with an, uh, a frame here to handle the, uh, the large timbers coming out to load onto a flat car. This is that spur that goes into the head rig. I have a spurs out here for the outside storage. And then this spur runs underneath this large building, which is dry storage. Now, despite the fact that I said all of the material was cut was pretty large, I do have some stacks of smaller stuff. And uh, eventually those are gonna go off the layout. They don't really belong. So did you move the heavy stuff on carts with wheel, steel wheels or? Um, well, out. that's you no. Know, there's still yet to some other structure to go here. There'll be a, a essentially a, a gantry oh, crane sure. that covers this entire area, sure. and they would put them in, put the logs, the or the beams into slings, and carry them out and maneuver them to stack onto the, uh, onto the uh, flat cars. They moved an awful lot of stuff with muscle, and cables and block and tackle. And then here is a crossover, but well, between this is the siding and the main line. And I installed this crossover later that helps maneuver uh, cars in and around the mill. So that's basically it for tonight for the, uh, for the mill site itself and the general structures. This is the site. And I have the storage building here. There's a boiler house here. Uh, there's dry storage out here, and then here's the log dump track, and then right here is a, a spur that handles the oil uh, by tank cars. So in this one little location, I've got spots of dry storage, a spot or two for uh, cars in the stacks, a spot here at the head rig, uh, a spot here for a couple of cars at the uh, sorting table. Uh, dock, and then a spot here for that one location at the site of the, the building itself uh, where smaller stuff comes out. So I, I think there are six different spots or so here in this one little location. The other thing that was important to me was to understand what happened to all this material because a, a sawmill is just more than moving big logs. Uh, so you've got supplies coming in. So you've got machine tools and repair parts. Um, you've also got the raw logs coming in here, but you've also got a number of supplies and so on coming, including the oil uh, coming in here. Uh, those are inbound movements. Outbound, these uh, cut pieces will go to Coal Creek and all out, some will be sold off site uh, through the Denver Rio Grande. Others of the material will be used up at the, the mines. I've got mines here and mines over here. And in the town of Mineral here, I've got a couple of building supply companies and so on and so forth. So movement cars in my bills of lading will move from here to Coal Creek out to Mineral or Morton rather, and over here to Mineral and the mines itself there'll also be some movement of some raw material or cut lumber rather all the way around the stairway up to Tiger Mountain. And then for the operating session, there'll be a train or two that originates up here of raw logs. Those come down, down to the mill and, are, and then empties are brought back up. But I've also set it up so the trains handle cars that are being moved from Tiger Mountain stop to bunkers. They may be coming here to, to uh, the town site here or come on down all the way down to uh, Cold Creek for moving to the outside. That's 
freight that's being moved in with the logs themselves. So the, the train crew coming down has got two different types of stuff to handle. And then uh, they'll drop those cars here, switch the, uh, the, the raw logs in, the empties out, and then take those the rest of that train into Coal Creek, service the engine and return. So that turn from Tiger Mountain down to the mill, et cetera, takes about two hours. And usually uh, one guy can handle that, but often it's a lot more fun to have two guys doing that. So that's the presentation, guys. Great. Any other questions or comments? Incredible layout. Oh, well, thank you. Beautiful um, work. Nice presentation. Uh, a couple of comments. Uh, it's easily maintained. It's big enough for all of the things I wanted to do, but not too big to be overwhelming. And I think that's a problem with some of the layouts that are really great, but it takes four or five guys to maintain them. And so my counsel to anybody building a layout, keep in mind that sometimes big is good, but too big is not so good. The other thing, well, as most of you know, you've operated here or visited the layout, uh, everything from Coal Creek on up into the mountains is handled by geared locomotives. No rod locomotives come up here. So they tend to move a little slower. So to operate from Coal Creek up to Tiger Mountain, uh, take if you just run the locomotive with a train without stopping and doing anything else, it's an actual five to 10 minute run at, at uh, normal speeds. That was my next question is your, were you losing geared locomotives or not? So thanks for that. Yeah, I have Heislers and uh, Shays and Climaxes. Did I miss Russ? Do you bring coal down from the mines? Uh, yes, on the... Uh, well, I don't bring coal down from the mines, but I do handle coal, coal cars on the layout because coal is used at the mine to power the boilers, which operated the electrical supply to the mines themselves. What and coal like? was moved up to Tiger Mountain um, to uh, help fuel uh, stoves and that sort of thing in the commissary and, and whatnot. They didn't burn a whole lot of the scraps because there wouldn't have been scraps up at the top very much anyway. But the, no, there's no coal mine as such. The coal, the cars that I have on the layout are hopper cars uh, that handle and ore cars that handle the uh, the different ores from these various. I've got three different mines and locations. What, what are those? What are you mining? It's a a, a, a material called moosite. And uh, I've got a little handout for the layout, but moosite is a, a material that's used um, in specialty brewing. And, uh, you know, the Northwest is famous for its microbreweries. But moosite is a key ingredient to a moose drool, which is a very popular drink up here. How do you spell moose? <laughs> it's not French. <laughs> it's M O M O O S E. Do you have an interior in your sawmill? I can't remember. Not yet. I do have uh, 3D printed uh, components for that. that. That's one of my next things is to uh, uh, do the, uh, uh, the various elements in the mill, which will include the basic bandsaw and uh, carriage and a couple of resaws and trimmers and edgers um, and the uh, live rolls and dead rolls and the transfer tables. Um, and so we can all see it where you have some lighting in there? DM yes. Yeah, that's one of the, the presentation that I've got uh, putting together in the future. Um, one of the things I would mention in the structures, the trusses on the, the mill, uh, I've got it set up so that uh, there's PC board, uh, you know, the uh, clad on both sides, the eighth inch wide pieces that are eight or so inches long. And I've got the lights 
tack welded or soldered the leads one to each side so that I end up with a series of, of uh, circuits that and you, these uh, these pieces just blend right in with the uh, ceiling structure, the roof structure. When they're painted black, you don't even see them. And those are all set up, ready to go. Uh, I've got an awful lot of photography of the interior of mills. Uh, and I'm happy to share that with anybody uh, at any point. Because uh, there was just an incredible array of machinery. Uh, the problem is getting stuff in S scale. But I was able to find some stuff now that's printed in, and 3D printed. So I've got to paint it. And, but I do, I do have a, uh, several plot plans of the interior of the mills, various mills with the floor layout designed so that it would move the material prototypically. Russ, do you have a planer or is all of your wood uh, rough sawn? Uh, it's rough sawn. Um, the rough lumber would be sawn, you know, packed off to a a finishing mill at an offsite. And, well, uh, you know, if I had time or interest or room to build a, a, a planing mill, it would probably be down in the town of Coal Creek. If used for mines, couldn't it be so yeah. rough cut? Oh, yeah, all of that was rough cut. There's an awful lot of really good video of uh, timber being cut. Uh, the problem was the, the hell of a lot of waste from the big uh, circular blades because of the curve. And if you're cutting thousands of board feet, you're making a lot more sawdust than you need. So a bandsaw is better. The blade was thinner and uh, quick uh, for cutting large structures. Uh, one of the mills in the Converse Basin area had one of the largest bandsaws in the world. The circumference of the blade is 96 feet. Give you an idea how big a sucker was. You could cut, well, most of the timber was uh, anywhere from 8 to 12, 15 feet in diameter uh, in the, uh, the redwood area and the big sugar pine. Not much, but sugar pine, which was very typical of this area, Logs ended up being anywhere from six to eight feet in diameter. And that's kind of the pattern on my layout. A friend of mine used to work in the saw shop for um, a warehouser out in what, North Bend? Yeah. He said uh, they'd work all night uh, on sharpening saws, the big band saws, like you say, a wheel above the ceiling, a wheel below the floor, so that you've got band in between uh, going up and down. He said, uh, if we got our saw sharp, we went out in the yard and took uh, four to eight inches of bark off the upper side of the logs because we got tired, the mill got tired of dragging <coughs> big logs out of the pond, ripping out all their headers and lights. <laughs> and they said they had an 11 foot clearance, but it helped to get another eight inches. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the thing about this one mill at Converse Basin, they had a thing called a splitter. And these gigantic logs, 15, 16 feet in diameter, they cut into four sections. Uh, initially with a huge big bandsaw, this 96 footer uh, that I just first mentioned. And the, the log was laid on a cradle. It was like a fork. And the log was laid in between the two tines of the fork and was pushed through the span saw and cut in half. And then those halves each were cut again using this splitter. And those big chunks of wood were then sent through the regular mill process. I've, I've got a lot of photographs of those <clears throat> and they, they're really quite large. Okay, anything else you guys? I. Uh, I'm happy to loan some of these books to guys who are interested in researching the mills, but there's a ton of stuff online. And if you have a specific question, just to give me a call and or an email, and I'll try to track it on some source uh, for you. Great work, um, Russ. Yeah, awesome. Was there a powerhouse, some sort of electrical source? Or is that in the boiler house? 
uh, the boiler house was designed to run elect to generate electricity. Okay. And a lot of the mills were electric. There are many of them were originally belt driven off of a uh, a big steam engine. Electricity was much preferred because it was much more flexible and other advantages. And some of the early ones out here were were all electric. So some of the small towns in logging country had better <laughs> service than some of the big towns. Now, how many of you have been out to Snoqualmie to uh, see some of the stuff out there? They've got quite a bit uh, of information at the, at the museum uh, and then the little museum in North Bend. And uh, so there's a lot of information. There's, in fact, there's a pretty good display of a big log on a, uh, on the mechanism for the, uh, the cutting out uh, in the, the park there by the depot. All right, well, if you're interested, I'll do a, a, a put together a clinic on this construction of the mill itself and some of the other structures. But all of that basically is all scratch built except the uh, the boiler, boiler house, and that's a, a Banta kit. All right, anything oh, else you guys for the yeah, good of the order? Much, how, how much time have you put into it so far? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, well, the thing is you get really busy and build like, a, like crazy at the beginning. Okay, the original layout stopped right here and right here. I built it from Coal Creek up to the Y here at uh, what became uh, Bunkers. And this all track work was all in. Then subsequent to that time, I built this extension around the stairs to Tiger Mountain. And then I punched a hole through the wall here and built this little fiddle yard, which became the town of Morton. And then the last thing I built was this L, which became the town of Mineral. Didn't you used to have a couch? In there the was a sofa right group? here, but everybody wanted to flop on that sofa. Got rid of it. Well, I had a TV underneath the layout right here. So I could sit on that sofa and watch football or whatever. And it was pretty handy. You can't get much built watching TV though, Russ. No, <laughs> but I haven't built a whole lot on the layout. You go in spurts. Well, you all know this. You'll go in spurts and then you run out, out of energy. Now, one of the things to uh, you, everybody should know this uh, Steve DiPolo was building a huge big HO layout, but uh, he kept some of his SN3 stuff and he, so he's going to build a chunk of SN3 again. And he's starting to acquire some more SN3. So we'll have some narrow gauge stuff with him going here this summer. It's coming summer. And I will be starting to operate here and work session or operating sessions sometime in uh, late November and all through December and January. And those typically would be on the evenings on, on, on weekends. All right, guys, well, let's shut it down and uh, go finish your dinner or finish your homework or something. Or back to the layout. <laughs> Thanks, Russ. Very enjoyable. Good kickoff. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Russ. Thanks. Thank you, Russ. Thank you. Good to see you guys.